So, a Yitzi hackathon, that's obviously an exciting thing to come, uh, particularly for you, Emil. You as one of the fathers of Yitzi. What, what, do, you, what do you want from this uh, baby wedding session, um, schooling, or whatever it is, you know, when we take Yitzi to the next level? What, what would you like to get out of the hackathon? Well, look, I, I, I often tell this story that um, the main reason I'm in this is uh, because I, uh, I'm obsessed with the notion of solving problems, actual problems that people experience in their day-to-day -day lives um, so, so that, you know, uh, so that we can justify our existence on this planet. Um, and uh, ultimately, I hope that whatever problems are bothering people, um, that they would come and attempt to solve them. Now, ideally, we'd love to make this a more uh, education-oriented session. So, uh, you know, everyone has to go through some sort of education these days, whether it's in school, in university, whether it's, you know, um, um, uh, increasing your competencies in, in any other way. Um, so you know what the problems are. Ultimately, deep inside you, you know what are the things that bug you out there and go and solve them, right? That's, that's, that's the point of open source, that we give you this basis that you can step on and you can go and address issues that are, that are bugging you specifically. Now, if you want ideas, there's obviously things that people are often asking for, such as breakout rooms, the ability to express emotions. People are not always uh, comfortable turning their video and audio on and off, so it's good to give them um, other things, other um, means of, of expressing emotions during a conference. So these are all uh, you know, good things to, to start with, but ultimately I'd like people to focus on what would I like to have different in an education session and just go in and, and you know, bang in that. Sure. So, so for me, I, I have experience with hackathons from other uh, free software communities. They're called in different ways depending the community you come from. Like sprints is a common name for these things in, in communities I've been a member of in the past. And I'm a big fan of them because f as, as a first thing, they offer a way to onboard either new people that are not familiar at all with the code base, or maybe even people who are familiar with the code base, but not all of it, that can be familiar with other parts of the code base, it's also very useful. Uh, it offers a moment which is a synchronized moment where you know people set aside time to work together in that specific Time frame, and that usually helps a lot with being uh, you know, more efficient. And also, ultimately, it's something that helps community people bond, create some bonds. So, you, of course, it was it's different when you, we could have uh, hackathons in person, but even if they're not in person, even if they are remote hackathons, they really help creating some kind of bonds which goes beyond the technical collaboration that usually are very useful to make and keep a community healthy. So that's that's what I wish for, for this hackathon for people interested in Jitsi. What I would say that uh, hackathons in general basically speed things up, right? The the uh, the, the great thing about free and open source software is that it is open to collaboration. Everybody can contribute as they wish, but sometimes um, it's it's a lot more efficient to pull the rope, if you wish, at the same time on one place, being it virtually or being it physically in one place. And that's exactly where the hackathons um, can contribute, uh, being it on brainstorming on actually um, uh, on the issues uh, to, to resolve uh, or, or being it just, you know, with the atmosphere, basically your brain is stimulized and you just focus on this thing and, and you finish the things. So thank you, that, that, that's uh, really good points. So we're hoping for lots of people from, from academia, from school, with a school background, who come with their, their, their ideas, their requirements, their things they would like to see in Jitsi to, to uh, implement those and to, to actually form a community and, and touch base with each other. The, if you look into uh, this open source thing at school, is there, from, from, a, from a general perspective, an expectation, a hope? How do you see that evolving? I mean, we can buy lots of software nowadays from all different types of companies, and uh, some, some uh, less European than others, obviously. Uh, how, how do, what role does something like Yitzi, which doesn't come with a license cost, 
doesn't come uh, with um, a baggage of uh, data protection uh, to it. What, what role do you think something like this uh, can play in our education environment in Europe? Well, I, I, I could start on this one. Um, you know, so for, uh, first of all, it's, it, it's important to recognize that, um, you know, open source um, uh, is an environment where code is available for free. It doesn't mean that the end solution provided to the user is still available for free. And I like it to, I, I like to, to point that out because um, um, sometimes it leads to mismatched expectations. Um, there is a cost associated to, to running open source. Um, you are, for example, in many cases, uh, taking stuff in-house and running it in-house and, and then not benefiting from the um, you know, rather significant efficiency optimizations that you get from the cloud. Uh, because now you're all, all of a sudden responsible for running all of these servers yourself. Now, um, you may very well have legitimate reasons to do that, um, and and I think this is where this is where the value of open source in education is. It's like um, you mentioned yourself. Sometimes there are concerns for the privacy of the data, and we have to be careful uh, to navigate pragmatism and and religion here. I see people often um, sacrificing one at the cost of the other. Uh, you know, we have to find the middle line. But also, I think where it is really important um, uh, to, to, to know the advantages of open source is, again, I, I really like like uh, how Marcel put it. Um, the whole point of open source is making it easy for people to collaborate. It removes friction away from, um, fr from a collaboration. You know, I was involved back in the days, I was involved in a few European project uh, consortia. Um, and... I was I was young back then, and um, I was really surprised at how much effort it takes to just agree for a bunch of, of entities, companies, universities, laboratories, what is it that we're going to do and under what terms we're going to do it. And there were months and months spent in discussions on that, you know, and then you would have like a 20, 30 percent acceptance rate of, of an actual work that will get done will be much, much, much downstream. And that's what open source really removes. So to bring this back in, um, you know, in the current context is, look, you are an educator and you are passionate about what you're teaching people and you know exactly how you want to teach it. So I've, I've dealt with many educators in my life. I have been teaching classes in different universities. And I know that people who care know exactly how they want to teach what they want to teach. And this is where open source can help you because, hey, you don't have the exact tools that, that are going to make your class possible the way you want it to be possible. Here you are. You, you, you can go and do it. So it's an enabler of different ways of teaching. And I think we need that today, especially when we need innovation in teaching, because some of the traditional ways of teaching are no longer going to be just as possible as they were before. So um, um, that's that's how we should look at it, as an opportunity. I hope that made sense. Yeah, so I, I myself right now, I'm an educator at the big public university in France. And uh, so I very much agree with the point that uh, Emil made about collaboration. Another framing for this, which I really like, is that of control. So for me, free software is about the possibility of controlling your technology, technology stack when it comes to software. So at the university, I think it's very important, but in general, in education, not only university. Anyway, it's, it's very important that you are in control of the software stack you use, both for privacy reasons. So you mentioned that, of course, there are all the student data, which is something you manipulate with any software that is used by students, but also in terms of giving the example. So university have, in general, the potential to self-host uh, free software projects. They have the knowledge to do that. Of course, they are not always willing to pay the cost of doing the maintenance themselves, but in the case they are, it's really important that they actually show that they can you know, manage themselves the software they use for teaching. And if they need, they should have the ability to change it, which is something which is potentially possible with any piece of a software, but something that you cannot do for proprietary solutions. So I think this is very important, both in terms of you know, 
having more trust in the software that manipulate the data of your students, but also to teach students that it is important that the tools they use for what they do, which is studying, which is doing research, doesn't matter, is something they should be in control of. So if we rely only on free software solution for teaching, we are also showing the example to the students and hopefully they will keep doing that and keep that in mind when they go on with their lives and choosing the technology that they're gonna use in the rest of their lives. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I would say that's a great point, um, you know, uh, and, and, and we can very easily extend it uh, when we speak about open source and, and teaching. Um, we have an, an enormous, enormous opportunity with open source to involve the students in the process of developing these um, solutions, be it anything. And, and you know, today with um, uh, things like the development board, such as, uh, you know, the Raspberry Pi with uh, 3D printing at your fingertips, um, they can very easily contribute to any uh, free and open source um, software project. Um, uh, they can, uh, if not, you know, start with programming, they can, you know, file bugs, they can update documentation. There's a lot of uh, ways how to contribute to a project that maybe people don't realize from the very first start, but, but it's exactly like that. And, um, you know, if uh, these students then later uh, realize that maybe, um, becoming a developer is something that they want to pursue in a career, then I am pretty sure that having in your CV that you contributed to this project or that project also helps. And there are already companies today that pretty much require that, that if they are looking for someone to work on a project, and let's be fair, free and open source software is not about um, having uh, the, the software at, at hand gratis, like no payment, the, the, the free is more importantly in freedom. And there are companies who have business models built on, on this type of freedom. And they are heavily involved in enormous open source project like, uh, the Linux uh, kernel, for instance. And now if they are looking for someone as a kernel developer, they probably also want you know, to see some work from them. And what is better than showing, uh, look, I contributed with this uh, to the kernel already. And what is a better qualification for such a job than this? So I think um, we can, very well shape uh, the education uh, this way so that people become, um, uh, you know, more and more involved already, you know, <laughs> to be to be honest, already as kids, this can really start uh, as early as, uh, you know, where, where uh, they are really small kids. It, it doesn't have to be really a student of an uh, of a computer science or anything like that. Um, as I said, uh, the development boards such as Raspberry Pi make it very, very easy to uh, to contribute. I love that. I love that argument, Marcel. And I think it is, um, in a way, this this absolutely fantastic privilege that we have as software engineers. That uh, you know, I remember myself when I was doing one of my internships in university. And I was trying to, you know, to, to kind of see myself through the years. And I was thinking, okay, so what are the next steps? And does that, uh, I, I want to get to this, to this place. I want to be uh, working on very sophisticated real-time communications things. And I was looking at the companies that were doing that. I was looking at the jobs that they had, and they were all very advanced jobs. Uh, and I was thinking, well, I cannot, uh, I cannot apply to any of these because I don't have the experience that they're looking for. Uh, does that mean that I absolutely have to go through years and years of doing things that I don't really like? in order to get there. And this is when open source became uh, really obvious to me. It's like, wait, I, I can actually go and 
either contribute to any of these projects or start something of my own and 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 then just accumulate experience that way and then through the years i've seen that happen many times first of all as an employer myself um being able you know there's um for years and years we've had to rely on proxies of competence like we we've had to rely on diplomas we've had to rely on certificates of, of, of various sorts and all these are you know um, uh, circumstantial indicators that maybe you're competent in what in, in the position that you're applying for there's nothing that certifies competence as much as well go and do the thing that you're applying for you know every time we would um, 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 this, this every time that we would accept um, um, applications for the project or for our company, uh, we would first go and look and, okay, what did you do? What, what code is out there for, you know, the talk is cheap. Show me what you did. And then secondly, and this is an advantage for, for employers as well. It's if your project is open source, you are absolutely liberated from the, from the use of proxies because you can just take the project and say, Hey, here, here's a project, you know, go and show us how you would implement this problem. So you can see whether the, the, the person applying is competent at the job that they're applying for and what level of competence they have. And you can assess that very easily. I think that is a fantastic advantage that we have in, in this industry. So let me add something because I, I, I really agree with this point about the, uh, the specific advantages of free software in class. And one uh, another one which I, I often see as, a, uh, as an educator in computer science specifically is that if we can guarantee to students that all this, the tools they use for teaching are free software, then there are no arbitrary barriers for them to fix a bug they might encounter in their experience as a user. As a teacher, I would be very sad if at some point users, my students are using a tool and it misbehaves, or maybe just they don't like the way they're doing something. And if someone comes to me and say, hey, how can we fix that? How can I change that? If it is not free software, at, at some point in the stack, I will have to tell that student, sorry, you cannot do that because we don't know how it works internally and you cannot change it. On the other hand, if all the stack they use, including, you know, uh, stuff for conferencing is free software, I can tell to the students, the source code is there. Go and try to figure out if you can fix it yourself or if, or if you can change it yourself. And as a, you know, as a teaching experience, as a learning experience, it's much more different to tell them it's just up to you to figure out how it works rather than, sorry, you just cannot do that because it's secret. And I, even me as a teacher, I don't have access to that information, so I cannot help you. So that's you, a very, very big difference. Do you often see that work, um, Marcel? A... Uh, uh, so not, so it doesn't, it didn't happen to me yet with, you know, conferencing tool, uh, but it did happen to me, for instance, with the kernel. I've been teaching, you know, system programming for a very long time. And some point, sometime you encounter specification that, you know, behavior that is different from what is documented. It might happen because, you know, all the variants of Unixes that are out there. And if they're using the Linux kernel, I can tell you, hey, try to figure it out in the source code of the kernel. If we were using, you know, a proprietary Unix system or uh, another proprietary operating system, I cannot tell them, try to figure it out yourself. So it has definitely happened to me in system programming classes. Thank you. These are amazing aspects. I mean, who wouldn't be motivated to participate in a hackathon like this? Because it gives you the chance to, to create a credential for your own competence that you can set out and you don't need the stamp of a university of or whatever it's it's there and and yeah, this is what i've done and this is what i've contributed and this is what i'm able to contribute as well and i like the argument you brought across is like what by open source it's a differentiator it can be a differentiator for the teaching uh, community and for 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 the stu for for the universities and for the schools to design their tooling around their uh, unique selling proposition for how they actually do the teaching. That's an amazing aspect. And and uh, free equals freedom. Um, and, and I wonder, Marcel, is our, we're getting really at the core values of the European Union, I think. This, this is the way that we that we live. This is our European way uh, way of life, where we are freely, at free as individuals collaborating and the control allows us to stay in control of the data of what we do and the way that we actually uh, share. So does, does this actually, uh, actually going forward help us in our competitiveness even as a European Union? Um, I, I am convinced about that. Uh, there, is a, there are a lot of discussions 
um, uh, lately about the digital sovereignty of Europe. Now, what does it actually mean? For me, it, it, it's something that never has been protectionism. Sovereignty for me is not protectionism. Uh, what I would pursue is sovereignty through collaboration. Um, sovereignty that builds on the strength that we have. Um, we have definitely a lot of great developers in Europe that contribute to a lot of various projects, being it commercial, being it non-commercial. Uh, look at the Debian project where there are developers around the world, including Europe, of course. We have a lot of uh, very good European initiatives that would deserve more attention, like uh, Mastodon, for instance, or Ecosia, um, uh, you name it. So I don't think that our European way to be uh, more sovereign in the, 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 uh, the digital space is to um it, it is to uh, kind of it is protectionism it, it is to kind of pr protect I, I i don't even know why we call it protect right because it's a it, it's not protecting anyone it, it's an uh, uh artificial barrier that we should not build and we should rather co collaborate and i totally agree that in the end um if you think it through it's at the heart of uh the European values. So I think it pretty much fits what we've been doing as a European Union, where uh, different nations uh, collaborate, where uh, individuals, regardless of their origin, uh, collaborate. And in the end, we can uh, resolve issues much more efficiently and we can make great things happen. That, that that sounds really that uh, it almost sounds like a patriotic duty for a, any European software developer to participate in something like a like this hackathon here. Um, the the point of uh, that you mentioned about bringing in uh, features that you love that you want to see in 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 some of the big uh, companies they say we build products that we want to use, so you can do. The same thing here. No? So, so how if I participating as as a, a specialist as a developer in this? Well, how does that work really? How how can I come in and propose just something, or do I pick from a list? And and how do I have to think about it for the for the people who have never participated in something like this? So um, the um, j just to be clear, uh, there's probably two. Uh, uh, two segments of, of of the answer to that question. One is okay. How do how do I do it in practice? You know, what do I what I have to say? And that's simple to answer. You know, just say that you are just start building the thing that you want to build, and then that's what you're participating with. And you don't need an approval uh, from us, although you're certainly welcome to have a conversation uh, and and get our opinion on it. Um, then I think the more interesting question is how do I know that I'm really doing something worthwhile? And, um, and I think the recipe for that is um, problem first. Make sure that before you do anything, you are able to coherently define the problem that you're solving in your head. And then think about how much of that is a problem that is specific to my environment, to my day-to-day -day needs. You know, I've configured my, my desktop in a certain way and I do my things a certain way. And I, it would be great for me if I could plug in this additional component here. That's a mistake that, that, that many people do. And the reason it's a mistake is because then you end up creating a solution for yourself. Um, and hopefully that's not what, what you set out to do. Um, what you really want to do is, okay, I think that in general, like think, think in more general terms, the problem is, uh, for example, you want to solve, let's, 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 um, uh, let's take something rather trivial. Um, there's a privacy aspect of um, you know, participating in conferences with video. 
And uh, what I've heard from many educators is that one of the uh, big issues that they're fighting with right now is um, no one turns on their video in a conference. No one turns on their Microsoft, their microphone. And they end up, um, teachers end up feeling like they're, you know, teaching to the wall. And it's a really, I can imagine how demotivating that is. I know that from my days as, as, as a lecturer, um, getting the feedback from people has been the most precious part. It's what motivates me and I believe most educators to just seeing that, that, that excitement of getting it at a certain point. And not having that is, I think, dramatic. So you would think, okay, um, that's the problem I want to solve. I want to improve the, the level of bidirectional communication between educator and, um, and students. And then you would think, okay, well, um, why is that a problem? Because many people turn off their camera. Okay, why do, why do you do that? Um, and, you know, part of the people do that. Well, because there's a mess behind me. You know, I could tell you, well, clean up your room, but that's not going to uh, necessarily be an advice that everyone follows, although I hope they do. Um, then the second best thing, okay, how about we hide your room, right? And, and you don't have to, uh, to worry about it. Uh, and this is how you come up with something like blur. Now, obviously, obviously, that's a it's it's a very it's a very an easy example. We weren't the first to think of blur, although we ended up doing it. But it was important that we knew that this was why we were doing it, you know, because that also helps you limit your scope as you're as you're coding a feature. You will often be tempted to, oh, what if I added this little gimmick here and that little gimmick there? And then you you should be able to ask you, should I do that? How does that help the problem that I've set out to solve? So as you are applying and as you are working on the features that you'll be participating with, make sure that you always keep the problem in mind. And every little thing that you do, think about how it reflects on the problem that you're solving, the user problem, not a, techno a technological problem. How do you make life better for that user that you've set out to solve a problem for? So, Emil, you can say that I've actually not cleaned up my room, and that's why I have blur enabled. So, yeah, you're I, totally I, right. I was, I, was, I was about to say that, but then I thought. <laughs> that, that's fine. And let me just add something to, to Thomas' point. So, Emil said, this is what you need to do, you know, to focus the problem you're trying to, to solve. And then, and I think it's particularly important in the context of a hackathon, there is the way you do things. Because people think that in, in, in coding, well, just a matter of coding stuff up. And then, of course, if you're doing, of course, with code, if you're doing open source, you just send your patch and it will be accepted by the people and everybody everybody's happy. Well, it's actually a bit more complicated than that. Because behind every free software project, uh, behind most free software projects, at least, there is a community of people working together. And getting your fix or your improvement accepted means doing things in the way that specific community of people does it. So uh, I teach a class in, in free software in which rather than teaching, you know, the technical parts, because in the most cases they have already seen that those parts in other classes, I teach students, you know, how to get your code accepted. And it's all about getting to know the habits of the community you want to contribute to and adhere to those habits, which often are not the way you would do things yourself. But that's part of being, you know, working together with a group. And so the thing that I encourage people participating in this hackathon, but really in any other free software project out there is try, in addition to learning how to do the change you want to make to the code, to learn how people work, how they do things, and try to adapt your way of working so that you make the life easier for other people to you know, receive your contribution. And everyone works uh, happy together with you know, a lot less friction. And this is something which works very, very well when you have a synchronized time to work together in a hackathon than if you are asynchronous because we have a lot of round trips in which you have sent your code and no, please do it the other way and can be much faster if you do that during a synchronized event like a hackathon. And that also brings us um, uh, to, uh, you know, seeing it from a, a perspective that uh, open source software uh, development also uh, also teaches a lot more things uh, than just software development per se. It's just not the coding, right? It's about learn how to receive feedback, how to generalize things, etc. By the way, on that uh, particular use case, I already heard, and I mean, we are in video conferences all day um, these days during the pandemic. I also, you know, heard excuses why not uh, turning on the video that uh, people didn't have uh, their makeup on. So maybe that, that that may be a feature request for you to resolve uh, in Jitsi um, to, to, to fix the missing makeup. <laughs> 
and yeah. just out too uh, low. You know, go and make- try it. And if you end up finding people who like it, then um, then then more power to you. I would I would say, you know, um, uh, it is one of the values of our culture that we shouldn't judge things by their appearance. So I'm 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 kind of um, I, I find that a little bit conflictual with 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 this specific goal. Let's make let's prettify you. Uh, how about we focus on the things that 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 you're saying and and what really uh, we we need you to turn your video for is so that we can increase the bandwidth of communication so that we can see whether you're unhappy or happy or whether you're listening or whether I need to go back in my explanations. But sure, you know I can say all these things and then people are still going to be embarrassed um, uh, by not looking the best that they could be looking. I, I, that that that's just always going to be a fact of life. So you know. Um, Go and go and implement it, folks, and and let's see what we come up with. Um, Marcel, from 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 the political perspective, uh, anything you would like to to bring in? All of us have these wonderful eight ideas about why using open source in the area of education is, is super beneficial. Uh, for the teachers, uh, for the students, but then in the in the end, uh, you also find out that, that there are a lot of obstacles in the way um, to to actually do that, like um, that the learning software is um, mostly designed for. Windows. There is there are hardly any applications for uh, new slash Linux uh, from uh, the publishers of textbooks, uh, for instance. Uh, there is hardly any educational software for Linux. So, so those who want uh, to use learning software usually need a Windows computer, um, be it physical or virtual. And now. Um, of course, if you want to uh, extend the experience of students um, uh, being in touch with open source software for the reasons that we mentioned in the beginning of the meeting, how beneficial uh, that is, then as a teacher or as the institution, um, it, it, you need to go uh, an extra mile. You, you, you need to... Uh, specifically arrange things in a way that you can use open source software as as much as it is possible and and that of course um it, it is um a, a very difficult obstacle because it, it it should not be the teacher's responsibility to uh, take care of this. I mean, there are, of course, uh, teachers who are really committed. Um, and I can see that we, we have uh, now someone to help with our meeting. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, <laughs> uh, so we have committed, uh, we have committed uh, teachers uh, who go the extra mile and set up everything, but it should not be their responsibility in the first place. They should have that as a tool in in order um, to teach. So that I think is a big problem um, uh, to solve. And for that, we also uh, need to shape uh, the market in a way that this is possible. So uh, to, to, to put it bluntly, well, there should be um, a, a, a commercial space of companies that we have uh, in in the proprietary alternatives, why we don't have uh, so many alternatives in the open source world when when it is so beneficial. I mean, as I said in the beginning, it's not about that it necessarily needs to be for free. If the business finds an added value that they can put into this, then, then they can easily sell, right? Uh, so, so this is um, something that I believe um, the business should focus on, and uh, should should try to fix. 
Now, um, as I said, there are um, already, uh, you know, institution in, in the public sphere, for instance, uh, in uh, the education area that already use free and open source software. And now we need to see uh, what we what can be done to, to to harmonize and strengthen the initiatives that they have been taken. And that is exactly the subject of a project that I propose to be uh, included in the budget of the European Union and on which um, the uh, the European Union, uh, sorry, the European Commission will work on soon. And I'm really uh, looking forward um, to see that happening because at the end of the project, uh, we should have you know better mapped what are all the sorts of different free and open source um, uh, software pieces that can be used for different purposes. And we can a lot better coordinate how uh, to take uh, the, the benefit from that. So that's that's on one area. And another uh, area is that we've been seeing in the digital uh, markets um, over the course of the past, let's say, two, decade, two, two, two decades, uh, we've been seeing a lot of um, dominant positions to be built by uh, individual companies and kind of monopolizing markets. Um, it, it, you know, you can take uh, social networks as an example, but uh, it's also uh, software application uh, stores or repositories or whichever way you want to call it, etc. cetera. Um, th there, there is definitely more of them. And we need to look at uh, how uh, we can fix these issues on the digital markets. As an example, uh, what can serve is the recent uh, privacy policy change in, in WhatsApp. So another area where we have this problem. Uh, and that you know, showed that you know, um, users, when they wanted to switch from one particular platform to another particular platform, they had they struggled with that, and at some point, while while they were switching to uh, Signal or uh, to my favorite one, Matrix, because it's open source and federated, um, at some point, some of them started to uh, started flipping back because, well, it, it's very nice that you are on a, a different platform that maybe from your point of view as a user. Uh, your data is better protected, uh, it's open source and whatnot. Uh, but if there are no contacts of yours, if there are no friends, then, then why are you uh, on a platform um, of, of a chat system if you have no one to chat with? And, um, and we need to identify these, these areas and we need to identify um, um, the, these issues that we have there and think about how to fix the problem that very few you know large companies uh, capitalize on these network uh, effects that they are uh, or they became systemic operators on the market and then makes it really difficult to challenge them even if you bring a solution then that, that that is better uh, that that you are trying to compete with so uh, this is something that uh, i would like to address in the digital markets act uh, allowing both businesses to compete and users also to gain more control over their data. Um, for instance, this can be done by obliging these companies to allow you know, users to, to uninstall, pre-install software, um, uh, use their right to data portability, or uh, uh, making these dominant, um, uh, uh, the, the, these companies in dominant position um, uh, make interop allowing interoperability uh, mandatory for them, so that others then can interconnect and and users can have uh, an um, uh, a seamless user experience across different platforms. So so that's what I think uh, what uh, what the European institutions can do about improve uh, the situation of uh, free and open source software 
but also going beyond that. So if I may, a, a quick one on that. So I, I really like your zooming out. See what I did there uh, in the beginning of your comment from the uh, specific needs of video conferencing to the, the old teaching software. And so I think we should also zoom out furthermore from the specific need of teaching software to the specific need of any software that a citizen of the EU need. Because I think we are very in a very particular, you know, time in which many of us have felt the importance of using free software for software that is used in schools at all level because suddenly we all realize that all the data of all the students are at stake and so there is this uh, like collective awareness of the risk of giving all those data away but that problem is exactly the same when you come to any other use of citizen data when they you know relate to public institutions so maybe if uh, as an unwanted tactical suggestion we should take this you know, moment of awareness to make people realize that this this problem is not specific to to teaching names it's really a very global problem that all citizen in the eu should face and we should have as a goal the fact that any citizen on the of the eu can interact with any public institution at all levels using only free software and we are very very far away from that goal but this is the time to you know to, to explain to people that if you care about that for your kids when they are in school you should care about that for any citizen in the eu so i i uh, love the intentions here and i think they're they're worthwhile um so uh, you know pareto distributions are a fact of life and you want to fight uh, against you know corrupting these things where you have dominant players at the top uh, that are uh, that end up you know corrupting that hierarchy and and prevent people from coming in and bringing a bringing in innovation now one thing that i would like you uh, to to be careful of as as um, um, you know people who are in service of the european community and trying to solve these problems is to please never forget the fact that um, Quite often, not always, although quite often, when we try to solve these problems by adding additional rules, it actually, there's, there's the perverse effect that these additional rules end up being easier to comply with for exactly the same big whale, whales that are corrupting these huge Pareto distributions. And, and, and sometimes uh, they involve cost in implementation or documentation or, st or, or compliance that is just unbearable for, uh, for smaller players. And you can see these things on many levels. Another thing, uh, another way where I, I've seen this um, uh, be, uh, you know, I've personally experienced um, an, an unnecessary hurdle is that we start from the place of, um, you know, uh, data governance and, and data protection. And then we go into this place where the easy solution seems like, seems to be something that is, well, um, uh, and that's something that I encounter. So, well, we, we'd like to run uh, we're going to use this local player here because they're local, they're not American, they're not stealing our data. Uh, and it's not really a sort of reason that we can afford today. So I'm I'm not American, but I do work for a U.S. company. I have tried my best my entire life to contribute my work for free. Uh, um, in, or rather, sorry, I'm not working for free, but I am. I tried my best for my work to be available for free. Um, and, and I find myself in these situations where certain people wouldn't do business with me just because my company doesn't have the right nationality. Uh, and they would then go in and choose things that are not open source. And, op you know, they, they're free to do that. I have no problem with that. But I want it to be for the right reasons. I want it to be because they're getting a better solution out of the, the, uh, of, of the private company than, than, than they are getting uh, from me. So my request for you folks is, is uh, uh, European public servants uh, is to please not forget that um, then and please not forget the, uh, the the perverse incentives that some sometimes end up in in these rules regardless of the great intentions mm. yeah so maybe to to address that I mean um, when it comes to data um, uh, uh, personal data um, uh, specifically then of course, um, it, it, it is very sensitive how we handle uh, these issues. And, and of course, I mean, uh, you have different legis type of legislations in place in different geographies, and that also needs to be taken into account. Um, um, 
what I wanted to say on, on, on the first uh, bit of what you said, that is something that is completely clear to me that we should not create rules that are uh, easy to comply for the big tech because they have the budget and burden those that are the small ones, burden mm -hmm. the volunteer projects, uh, burden um, the, um, uh, the open source uh, community, etc. Because then, then it's where the innovation uh, innovation uh, then is not going to happen, right? Because you cement actually the big players on the market, even though maybe you create some rules that uh, make it uh, uh, make it better in some aspects. Then, in the broader perspective, you practically lost, right? Um, that's why. The Digital Markets Act, I am apparently not the only person who realizes that. The, Re the Digital Markets Act, as proposed by the European Commission, uh, focuses on these so-called gatekeepers. So there is a definition of a gatekeeper. And the definition of the gatekeeper, um, uh, basically, uh, in a layman terms, says that it needs to be um, uh, a company in a dominant position uh, on on that market, and then then there are certain you know thresholds how uh, you how, how you define that this particular company is uh, is a gatekeeper. Um, but the the important thing is it applies only to them. So when I spoke, for instance, about you know being obliged to allow users to uninstall software being obliged you know to that the users can use their right to data portability being obliged to be interoperable with others that applies to the gatekeepers and now it's totally up to the small companies or to open source projects if they use this opportunity if they become uh, interoperable with with, with the big tech when we speak about, uh, I don't know, social networks or uh, chat platforms or whatever, but it does not impose any obligations on the small ones that of course need to have a breathing space to innovate. I'd love to see how this plays out in practice. I, I sincerely hope that it um, goes the way that we would all like it to, that it fosters innovation. Yeah, open source, now I like to say open source uh, is a lifestyle and it, it's a way to go about things. It's collaborative. It is this openness in, in the whole in the whole thinking. Uh, it's like, uh, what can I get? How, where can I collaborate? Where can I contribute? And this is, um, and this requires, of course, free individuals and it requires those free individuals to, to operate with a high degree of freedom. And uh, that's then the, the environment that's to be created from a political perspective. If we, uh, for argument's sake, uh, burden, whoever comes up with an open source software, put lots of liability issues uh, on, that, uh, on that person, which could be an individual somewhere who had a great idea and spend a couple of weekends to hack out some really great code then uh, we, we, we are stifling this. And I think that's what you're saying, Indian. So shall we call it a day then? Sounds good. And happy hacking to anyone who's going to participate in the hackathon. Yes, oh, oh, that's a good one. That's a yeah. good one. Happy <laughs> hacking, folks. And Thomas, thank you very much for uh, moderating this. Uh... Oh, thank you all. I mean, this is that easy job. <laughs> Thank you and good luck with your voting, Marcel. <laughs> Thank you very much and, and thanks for this conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. It's and, very exciting. And, and I, I keep my fingers crossed for uh, great contributions in the hackathon.